Welcome to our eBay AC accredited webinar from the ISCP's A to Z CV Pharmacotherapy series. Today's program will focus on Carbidogrel or Ticagolol. Why, when, or for whom? My name is Franco Cheng, and I'm a lecturer from the Department of Pharmacology and Pharmacy at the University of Hong Kong. And it is with pleasure that we are joined today by a fantastic faculty. Today, we have Dr. Craig Abivis, who is the Vice, Vice President of the Operation of Baptist Health of Bedouin and is an Action Assistant Professor at the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. He is also the Chair of the ACC's Cardiovascular Team Section, and he has diverse experience in the field of cardiovascular disease and also clinical pharmacy. And Hello. next, we have Professor... Sorry. And next, we have Professor Diana Gorok, who is an interventional consultant cardiologist at East and North um, Herbistry NHS Trust and Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine in, at the University of Herbistry and visiting Professor at Imperial College. And lastly, we have Mr. Sauteris um, Antonio, who is the consultant pharmacist at Boss Heart Center and lead cardiovascular pharmacist for the UCL partners. Today's broadcast is organized by the International Society of Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy, ISCP, and brought to you by the record Red Collect Cardiology. This is to be an interactive section, which will feature a panel discussion section followed by a live audience Q&A segment. So please feel free to submit your questions to the faculty via the question box on the webpage. And we will endeavor to answer as many as possible towards the end of the broadcast. So um, first of all, I would like to hand the time to Professor Gorok, who is going to present Corridograu or Chicago. Why, when, and for whom? Professor Gorok, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So the importance of ticagrelor and clopidogrel directly relates to the importance of coronary thrombosis. It wasn't all that long ago in the 1980s when the first very large post-mortem study in 100 patients who had sudden cardiac death confirmed that the arteries were blocked with a thrombus comprising of platelets held together by fibrin strands in the vast majority of patients who had sudden ischemic death. And furthermore, in those patients who had coronary thrombus, in the vast majority of those, there was a high-grade stenosis, so a severe narrowing underlying the thrombus. And so that takes us back to why, why does thrombosis occur? How can we prevent it? And can thrombosis present in different ways in the coronaries? Well, we know from a long way back again that thrombosis can either completely occlude the artery, which causes an ST elevation myocardial infarction. So we see ST elevation on the ECG, and we see the heart being deprived of blood and slowly beginning to infarct. Or if the thrombus partially occludes the artery or completely occludes and then unblocks and moves downstream, then the heart is, is not completely occluded in the artery and that presents in a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. So thrombosis is a major challenge for cardiologists and cardiovascular pharmacists and other healthcare professionals because the same process can present in different ways. It can present with an ST segment elevation MI, non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction and also following angioplasty with a stent thrombosis. Now, the etiology of coronary thrombosis, as I've already alluded to, is that thrombus usually forms on a severe narrowing that has developed over many, many years. So this is cholesterol-rich plaque that, as you can hopefully see on my pointer, slowly develops over time. And then when it gets to be very severe, the thin cap differentiating the contents of the plaque from the contents of the vessel wall can rupture or erode and that allows the contents of the flowing blood to come into contact with the contents of the vessel wall. 
And that plaque rupture then starts a series of events which begin with platelet activation and aggregation. So platelets, as they flow past the narrowing, begin to come together. At the same time, we have activation of the coagulation cascade. And through both these mechanisms, we have the development of thrombin and then finally a, a buildup of thrombus, which is essentially platelets held together by fibrin strands to stabilize the thrombus and occlude the vessel. Now, why do platelets become sticky and block the vessel? Well, there are many stimuli to platelets becoming activated, but I'm going to concentrate on the ADP receptor on the platelet surface. And this is very important. Whichever uh, route initially activates platelets, whether it's high shear, von Willebrandt factor, thrombin, eventually you get upregulation of the ADP receptor, activation of the ADP receptor, and that then causes uh, the platelets to start aggregating. So when do we use clopidogrel or ticagrelor in cardiac patients? Typically, we use it as part of dual antiplatelet therapy. So combined with aspirin, 75 milligram daily in Europe or 80 milligrams uh, in the US and in other parts of uh, the continents, but in essence, we give aspirin with clopidogrel or ticagrelor to ACS patients. It doesn't matter whether the acute coronary syndrome is managed medically or with angioplasty or bypass surgery. If the patient has had a recent acute coronary syndrome, we would expect them for a period of time to be on aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor. The other time when we typically use a combination of aspirin and clopidogrel is in patients who are undergoing an elective coronary stent placement. And then we give dual antiplatelet therapy again for a variable period of time, which could be a month or up to six months, depending on the type of stent used to prevent stent thrombosis. Now, as part of monotherapy, clopidogrel can be used instead of aspirin if the patient is truly aspirin intolerant or allergic and can't undergo desensitization. So how do the two drugs compare in terms of their pharmacotherapy? So we've got clopidogrel, which is a thionopyridine, and ticagrelor, which is not a thionopyridine, but it's a CPTP drug. Clopidogrel is a prodrug, so when you take clopidogrel, it has to be converted to the active metabolite by the liver, whereas ticagrelor is not a prodrug and does not need to undergo hepatic metabolism. Clopidogrel is irreversible, whereas ticagrelor has reversible effects. The onset of action is again very variable. In a stable, healthy individual, it can take between two and eight hours for us to see the effects of clopidogrel on platelet aggregation following oral absorption, whereas ticagrelor works much more quickly within 30 minutes to two hours. The offset of action, again, is variable. You can imagine that with clopidogrel, you're looking at a longer offset because it's irreversible, whereas ticagrelor, because it's reversible and because there's a turnaround in platelets, has a shorter duration. The half-life is shorter for clopidogrel, longer for ticagrelor. And we know that steady state inhibition of platelet aggregation is achieved in only about 60% of patients on clopidogrel, but about 90% of patients on ticagrelor. And the dosing is once a day for clopidogrel and twice a day for ticagrelor. Now, this just goes back to show you some of the pharmacodynamic uh, effects. Now, if you look at the dotted line here, which is clopidogrel, uh, the more dense line is ticagrelor, and this is placebo at the bottom. And our y-axis is the degree, the percentage of inhibition of platelet aggregation. You can see, first of all, that clopidogrel has relatively slow onset of action. And then even when you achieve so-called steady state, it really only inhibits about 60% of platelet aggregation. On the other hand, ticagrelor acts much more quickly, onset of action within about an hour or so, and then achieves between 80 and 90% inhibition of platelet aggregation. Now, how do these compare to just aspirin alone? So, <coughs> excuse me, 
Uh, we know that in patients who've had an acute coronary syndrome, so that is a heart attack, whether it's an ST elevation MI or a non-ST elevation MI, they have approximately about a 20, 25% risk of a recurrent adverse cardiac event if they take no medications over the next year. If we give them aspirin, we reduce the relative risk of heart attack, stroke or death by 22%. Following the widespread use of aspirin for patients with coronary artery disease, we then had the CURE trial, which added clopidogrel to aspirin, and that combination further reduced the risk of heart attack, stroke, or death by another relative 20% reduction. And we know that using a more potent P2Y12 inhibitor, that is aspirin combined now with ticagrelor rather than clopidogrel, we can further reduce the relative risk by a further 16%. Just to tell you a little bit about the CURE trial. So this trial was published uh, in 2001 and was the first evidence for the use of a P2Y12 inhibitor in patients with acute coronary syndrome. And since then, we've never looked back. This has been the staple treatment for all patients with acute coronary syndrome to use a P2Y12 inhibitor. If you can see here, you can see that compared to patients who just had placebo, those patients who received clopidogrel had a very early and significant reduction in heart attack, stroke or death, and that persisted right out to 12 months. And of course, that was clopidogrel on top of aspirin or placebo on top of aspirin. But as you can see on the panel on the right, clopidogrel did increase the risk of bleeding, significantly increased the risk of major bleeding, including the need for blood transfusion, but it did not significantly increase the risk of life-threatening fatal uh, bleeding. Most of the bleeding was typically gastrointestinal. PLATO was the next study eight years later, which investigated ticagrelor compared to clopidogrel in patients with acute coronary syndrome. So all patients had aspirin and half of them were randomized to receive clopidogrel and half of them to ticagrelor. And as you can see again, ticagrelor very significantly compared to clopidogrel reduce the risk of heart attack, stroke, death over a composite of about 12 months of follow-up. <clears throat> and importantly, there was no associated increased risk in bleeding with ticagrelor compared to clopidogrel. What these graphs also show is that the benefit of ticagrelor over clopidogrel in ACS patients was irrespective of how the coronary disease was managed whether the patient received just medical management, whether the patient received angioplasty with a stent, or whether they received bypass surgery. Ticagrelor appeared superior in reducing cardiovascular events compared to clopidogrel. Now, these are the hard clinical data. You can see that ticagrelor, around 10% risk of stroke, heart attack, or death over the one year follow up, closer to 12% with clopidogrel, and that was driven by a significant reduction in recurrent myocardial infarction and or cause mortality. What about bleeding? Very similar major bleeding between ticagrelor and clopidogrel, no difference in life-threatening bleeding. There was a significant increase in non-bypass related major bleeding, increase in ticagrelor compared to clopidogrel, but no significant difference in intracranial bleeding. Now, as I've mentioned before, once the pedigrel, ticagrelor are uh, taken orally, uh, these tablets are then absorbed through the intestine. And as I've mentioned before, clopidogrel is a pro-drug, so it has to go, uh, has to undergo metabolism in the liver to convert it to the active metabolite. This is different to ticagrelor, which does not need uh, to undergo further conversion. Now, going back to clopidogrel, I mentioned that it undergoes metabolism in the liver, and it does so by various CYP, cytochrome uh, P450 enzymes, the most important of which for clopidogrel is the CYP2C19 enzyme. Now, this is relevant because there is variability in the genotype for the CYP2C19 uh, gene. And we know that if you have one mutation, you have reduced uh, efficacy of clopidogrel. If you have, if you're a 
if you have both uh, mutations, so you have two loss of function alleles, then you are a very poor responder to clopidogrel and that drug may not be so effective for you. So how many people are affected by this? Well, most people have uh, no mutation, but about a third of Caucasians and African-Americans have one loss of function allele, but up to 50% of Asians have one loss of function allele. Again, with two loss of function alleles, this is where really clopidogrel may not work so effectively. That affects about 2% of Caucasians, 4% of African-Americans, and 14% of Asians. So in those patients who have two loss of function alleles, there is a threefold increase in the risk of stent thrombosis if you just treat them with clopidogrel and not, for example, ticagrelor or prasugrel. So that's very specific to clopidogrel. It's not an issue with ticagrelor, but we need to talk about some of the important side effects of ticagrelor that we need to consider. So one of the things we are always taught about is that ticagrelor can cause bradycardia. So we need to look for conduction abnormalities on the ECG, and it can also make people breathless. So if there is no other reason for the patient to be breathless, in other words, they don't have heart failure, they are not overtly beta blocked, then please consider ticagrelor as a cause for that. And that relates to an increase in plasma adenosine um, with, with this drug. So the main side effect, of course, of P2Y12 inhibitors, as I've alluded to already, is that they very significantly increase the risk of bleeding. So we have to balance the risk, the ischemic risk, the risk of thrombosis in a patient with the risk of bleeding on clopidogrel. So how do we do that? Well, we consider patient characteristics. So age, sex, history of prior ischemic or bleeding events, whether, they're, whether the patient is stable with chronic coronary syndrome or whether they've had a recent acute coronary syndrome Comorbidities that increase ischemic risk include chronic kidney disease, diabetes, peripheral arterial disease, and heart failure. Now, of course, if we're going to give them a P2Y12 inhibitor, we need to be careful if they're also getting an oral anticoagulant. So in combination with an oral anticoagulant, we want to be really careful about giving clopidogrel. So if a patient, for example, has atrial fibrillation, we would want to go with the drug that causes less bleeding rather than more. So we would favor giving clopidogrel with an oral anticoagulant rather than ticagrelor, if indeed an oral anticoagulant is mandated. And finally, we want to avoid procedures that increase the risk of bleeding. So if we do an angioplasty procedure, we want to do that via the radial approach, because the risk of major bleeding is very much lower than if we use a femoral excess. So these are some of the things that we should consider when assessing thrombotic risk. So I've mentioned diabetes already, but also procedure related risks. So multivessel stenting, complex coronary revascularization with multiple stenting, multiple overlapping stents where there's a bifurcation lesion and particularly if you've got a stent in the last remaining conduit. So if the patient has one artery left and it's got a stent in, if that stent goes down, that's really bad news for the patient. So for that patient, you might want to give a more potent P2Y12 inhibitor. And then there are other patient-related factors such as renal impairment and peripheral arterial disease. Now we can also assess bleeding risk and we do so by using the has bled score. So if you look down the left side, we've got has bled spelt out, and that relates to hypertension, abnormal renal or liver function, stroke or prior intracranial hemorrhage, bleeding history or bleeding diastasis, a labile INR if they're on warfarin, age above 65 years, or other concomitant drugs that increase the risk of bleeding, such as oral anticoagulation and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And that gives us a score for each of those factors to try and quantify the risk of bleeding for our patients. And that's the score there. And you get a, a maximum score of nine, which allows you to then gauge the bleeding risk against the thrombosis risk in an objective manner. So I've mentioned that we give 
uh, aspirin and clopidogrel or aspirin and ticagrelor as part of dual antiplatelet therapy for patients who have an acute coronary syndrome or elective PCI. And we've talked about the risk of thrombosis versus the risk of bleeding. But how long do we give it for? Well, if the patient has had an angioplasty and a stent, if they're stable, and if they've had a drug eluting stent or a drug coated balloon, if they're at high bleeding risk, then really one to three months of dual antiplatelet therapy should be sufficient. If they're at low bleeding risk, you would give dual antiplatelet therapy typically for six months. Looking at patients with an acute coronary syndrome, if they're at high bleeding risk, uh, then you would reduce your dual antiplatelet therapy for six months. But otherwise, if they're not at high bleeding risk, you would give dual antiplatelet therapy for a year. And that goes, that's very similar for ACS patients who are medically managed. So three to six months if they're at high bleeding risk, but otherwise the default is 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. And this just goes to show that the earlier you give the P2Y12 inhibitor in a patient with an ST elevation MI, the more benefit you can achieve. So you can reduce stent thrombosis, death, myocardial infarction and bleeding. So the earlier we give it to them, ideally in the ambulance, which is the standard of care, before they even reach hospital, the better and the more lives we save. So we've talked about the fact that these drugs, when they're given to the patients, need to be absorbed. Now, patients with heart attacks are often in pain. Uh, and they're given morphine in the ambulance or diamorphine. And that causes a problem because opiates slow gastric emptying and delay gastric absorption. And that can decrease the onset of effect of oral P2Y12 inhibitors. And you can see here that in terms of pharmacokinetics, patients who get morphine here in green have a much more delayed onset of effect with delayed seeing of raised plasma concentrations of ticagrelor compared to patients who get no morphine. And we also can see that this is the same in ticagrelor. If you give ticagrelor with morphine, it takes much longer to achieve therapeutic levels and inhibition of platelet aggregation. Now, to overcome that, we can optimize absorption by giving crushed ticagrelor with a pill crusher, which achieves much a larger surface area and much more rapid absorption than integral whole tablets. And this is particularly relevant for patients who are having a heart attack. Now, this is a, a very interesting study that came out not all that long ago, comparing clopidogrel with ticagrelor in the elderly. So this was a study in patients who were older than 70 years old, a thousand patients with non-ST elevation MI, randomized to either clopidogrel or ticagrelor slash prazogrel. And in essence, what this study showed was that there was the, the, the drugs were just as safe in preventing the risk of heart attack, stroke, or death in the elderly, but very importantly, use of uh, ticagrelor uh, increased the risk of bleeding compared to clopidogrel in the elderly. Now, what about if the patient is confined to, let's say, uh, one to 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, and they need to undergo some sort of non-cardiac surgery. So for clopidogrel, we would want to stop this uh, seven days before surgery. For ticagrelor, we want to really stop it five days, but three days is just about acceptable. It's a longer period of discontinuation for clopidogrel than for ticagrelor, but of course, one must always liaise with a cardiologist because it depends when the stent was put in what the risk might be with the patient stopping the P2Y12 inhibitor. So you never ever stop it without agreement from the cardiologist. So both drugs are P2Y12 inhibitors to prevent arterial thrombosis, given as part of dual antiplatelet therapy to reduce the risk of thrombosis, particularly in ACS patients, but also in stable coronary disease patients who are undergoing elective stenting. Both drugs increase the risk of bleeding, but ticagrelor may do so more than clopidogrel, particularly in the elderly. Ticagrelor achieves much more rapid onset of effect and provides much more potent inhibition of platelet aggregation than clopidogrel. And generally, ticagrelor is only indicated 
in patients with ACS, whereas clopidogrel can be used typically in stable coronary disease patients undergoing stenting, but also in patients who are at high bleeding risk with an acute coronary syndrome. And in deciding the duration of treatment, we should consider the risk of thrombosis versus the risk of bleeding to individualize that to reduce the risk of bleeding for the patient. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, that was a great overview of, of the landscape of who and when. And so I think at this juncture, we're gonna transition into making a little more uh, applicable or application-based and contextualize all that conversation with questions and added experience. So I think we have some cases to go through that will highlight some of the conversation that we, we just had. So first to present, JJ is a 57 year old male. He weighs 70 kilograms. He has a current past medical history that includes heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, hypertension, type two diabetes and epilepsy. His home medications include Losartan, 100 milligrams daily, spironolactone, 25 milligrams daily, and paglobosin, 10 milligrams daily, metformin, 500 milligrams twice daily, and levetiracetam, 500 milligrams twice daily. <clears throat> so he has called EMS or the ambulance for crushing chest pain that is not responsive to nitroglycerin. Uh, he has ST segment elevations on the ECG and the inferior leads, and he is taken immediately to his closest or close uh, P PCI percutaneous capable hospital. He has chewed or chewed up 324 milligrams of aspirin in the ambulance and is given five milligrams of IV morphine on arrival, has, has alluded to. Uh, in the lab, he is immediately taken to the lab and he's given 500 units of heparin bolus. And so the, kind of the conversation to uh, Dr. Antonio and, and the team is kind of some of the questions and discussions points I want to highlight in this instance and based on the information we just presented. So what in this situation, P2I12 inhibitor, would you give to this patient? And knowing if you see our poll, you should say, should every patient admit it with ACS receive a more potent antiplatelet rather than clopidogrel? And right now, the, the audience is leading to yes. So I would love to hear you know, what your thoughts and opinions are, especially in a case like this, knowing he's gotten morphine at this juncture and looking at it uh, from that context. So, Yeah, many thanks, um, Dr. Beavers. I think firstly, I'd like to thank Dr. or Professor Gorog for a really interesting talk, a nice summary of the process of acute coronary syndromes and placelet activation aggregation, which is so, so important and helps summarize the importance of dual antiplatelet therapy. But I think it comes back to Dr. Beaver's case around the popular age where the ischemic versus bleeding risk comes to apparent. So certainly I think for somebody who's quite young, who was 57, 70 kilos, would anyone here go against Ticagrelor, especially on the basis that he's likely to receive morphine in the ambulance? Would we? Would anyone go against Ticagrelor as a loading dose of 180 milligrams to administer that? And then maybe there'll be some questions as to where there's a glycoprotein 2B3A on top of that. I'd be interested to see what others' viewpoints are on that. Perhaps we go to Professor Gorog in the first instance. Thank you. So it's a really good case and, and really good discussion points highlighted there. So my first thought exactly as you've said, so this patient is at very high ischemic risk. He's already got a thrombus. We're about to do an emergency angioplasty. And the last thing we want is for that stent to block off. From what we know about him, there is no major bleeding risk. So immediately I'm thinking, uh, a potent P2Y12 inhibitor, I'm already thinking to Cagrelor. I'm also uh, mindful, of course, that he's had um, morphine. So we need to get this drug on board very quickly. Um, we should be crushing the Ticagrelor and, and getting this in as soon as possible. Um, I, I wouldn't be giving him anything else. So to contextualize this as well, and you know, writing this case, I, I wanted to put out there and in case you're in an area of the region, um, that does this, or are you guys or anybody using um, Kangralor? And, and just the reason I bring that up is clearly because there's a transition concern, depending on which agent you use and how to contextualize that. And uh, there's one item we didn't necessarily touch in, in the particular lecture, but just to com for completeness sakes, if, if someone were to, to get intravenous Kangralor, you know, kind of what 
what the thought process there, A, why would this patient be a good person for that, uh, that, that medication? And then B, you know, if, if we were to use it to, to talk a little bit about that transition piece. So would you like me to address that or? Uh, Please. Yes. Okay, go ahead and I'll so, come in after. Yeah, so, so certainly as an interventional cardiologist, we would use Kangrelor in two scenarios. One is where the patient is unable to have anything by mouth. So if the patient, for example, is intubated, ventilated, um, they've maybe had a cardiac arrest um, uh, and they are brought in uh, with an anesthetist ventilated and we haven't yet got an NG tube down. Um, and even if they've got an NG tube down in the setting of cardiogenic shock, um, absorption from the gut may be very slow and limited because of splanchnic shutdown of the circulation. So in that setting, either in a person who's unable to have anything orally or in the patient who's in cardiogenic shock with very low blood pressure, poor perfusion of their internal organs, that's when we would be using Kangrelor uh, typically <coughs> to very quickly get the Y12 inhibitor on board. Um, and then, of course, uh, we don't use this for everyone because there is a very significant cost to using Kangalore. And at the end of the Kangalore infusion, we hope that we would, by that stage, get an NG tube down and transition to um, to Kangalore typically. Sure. That's great. And just, uh, Dr. Antonio, what were your thoughts on this? Yes, it's really interesting. We looked at Kangalore locally. I think for us, our local practice is we tend to give a bolus of glycoprotein 2B3As purely as a bolus at the same time but there is the recognition as professor gorog has highlighted that if you aren't able to administer an oral drug we like to give the bolus of the glycoprotein to be three if they are considered high risk of a big thrombo thrombotic event just to help recognizing that we've got a morphine delay and to help with the absorption of the ticagrelor so I think it sounds like everyone's very keen to get this patient on a more potent or interplacelet. And interestingly enough, I think as we come towards the bleeding risk, I think it's really important just to recognize that the bleeding risks are cumulative. So if you were to compare various loading doses that we've done with clopidogrel dosing, so Amida 4, which looked at 1200 milligrams of clopidogrel, 900 milligrams or 600 milligrams, there was no difference in the risk of major bleeding. The risk of major bleeding tends to be cumulative, i.e. the longer you're on a dual antiplatelet therapy for, the more likely you're going to come out with the risk of major bleeding. And that's where we need to think about mitigating the risk. So acutely, I think everyone should think about having a more potent or antiplatelet, recognizing that having a STEMI, you've got that platelet activation, aggregation, as Professor Gorogs has alluded to, plus the addition of a potentially a PCI that also adds to the placement activation. And that's great. And you that's alluded to a lot of, a lot of good points there. You know, you're, you're pointing about two, three inhibitors well taken. You know, we've clearly seen data like Fabulous Pro and other things that indicate that if you give a bolus and, and give it, you can get a, a, a profile that's similar to an intravenous agent. And then your bleed risk is very much pertinent. And Dr. Gorg mentioned that in her presentation about you know, especially looking at how are we uh, pursuing the intervention, with, whether it's radial, what does that look like, and the risk factors and the bleeding risk that is there. And of course, obviously, you know, the option to crush the agent as well. I do want to go to a question or two questions that are in the chat, and it's uh, uh, very much related to, you, you can't talk about clopidogrel and ticagrelor without talking about the, the third agent, uh, Prasagrel. And so, uh, Dr. Gore, Dr. Antonio, you know, given the findings of ISAR REACT-5, should we consider moving to Prasagrel or, you know, in preference over ticagrelor and PCI? And I know the, the conversation is clopidogrel versus ticagrelor, but you can't skirt around this question at all. So... Shall I start and then Professor Gore will we'll alternate it? So I, I think there's a lot of validity of, of Prasagrel. Certainly in the UK, Prasagrel is generic, and that's certainly stimulated a lot of discussion with Prasagrel. So certainly for those who are high risk under high risk ACS who've undergone PCI, ISI React Five would suggest Prasagrel is certainly non inferior, if not superior. And interestingly, when you look at the Triton Timmy data and you look at the duration of therapy that related to the risk of major bleeding, 
the more longer you're on it, that's when they showed the risk of major bleeding. So as a reminder, Triton Timmy was up to 15 months, and that's where it showed that increase in the risk of major bleeding. So when they went head to head, because they're more both more potent or antiplatelets in comparison to clopidogrel, there was no difference in the risk of major bleeding. So I think we just need to be mindful as to how we manage acute coronary syndrome in wherever you are, whether it's medically managed, PCI or bypass. But certainly there could be an argument that for those high risk ACS that go straight to PCI, whether you use Prazagor or Ticagrelor is irrelevant. I think they're both equitable agents. And so I'm happy to consider that. And then for those that are for medically managed, you'd argue there is no data for Prazagor in the medically managed group. And if anything, there's been shown to be an increased risk of major bleeding in a medically managed group. Be interested in uh, Professor Gorbs. Yeah. Indeed, I, I think that's a very good, these are all very, very good points. I I agree. I mean, I think that you have to take um, eyes are react with a, with a pinch of salt in that it was a good study, but it's not a, it, it was an open label study. Um, it uh, was not a, a typical double blind uh, placebo controlled trial. Um, but nevertheless, I think we have to say that it, it did show a, a benefit. But I think we tend to think of these drugs, certainly in terms of the inhibition of platelet aggregation, the pharmacodynamics are essentially very similar with ticagrelor and prazagrel. So from a pharmacological perspective, what we're achieving is the same. I think nuances um, in studies uh, are, are, are just that. I think we need to be mindful that prazagrel certainly does very significantly increase the risk of bleeding. So I think if bleeding is not a major issue, uh, then I think one can debate whether you go with ticagrelor or prazagrel. Pharmacodynamically, they're exactly the same. Um, I think if bleeding is an issue, and you want to reduce ischemic risk, but you are worried about an excess risk of bleeding, I would prefer to use ticagrelor because the bleeding risk is certainly lower. Now that's a very good conversation and, and uh, all that in context. And you could also argue with Triton, you know, there was clearly a benefit in diabetic patients and our patient is diabetic um, in that context. And, and relate it to one of the questions in the chat, and you alluded to this in your slides, what about when you're choosing this for an elderly patient or choosing your oral P2Y12 inhibitor for an elderly patient? And I think you kind of touched upon that in your conversation. So just if you want to elaborate on that for the audience. Yeah, so I think that's a really good point. And I think we, we used to think all patients were equal. We're now much more focused on the elderly and realizing that we must minimize harm in these patients, as well as, of course, preventing thrombosis. So I think I would I would take three things into account. I would take the patient's ischemic risk into account. I would take the patient's bleeding risk into account. And also very importantly, consider how their acute coronary syndrome was managed. So for patients who are medically managed and who may be at a moderate or high bleeding risk. So in, a, in an elderly patient who's medically managed, I would feel far more comfortable using clopidogrel if they're at excess risk of bleeding. I think if the patient has a stent for an acute coronary syndrome, then I think it really boils down to, is the bleeding risk higher than the ischemic risk? So, and that depends on the patient risk factors. So obviously not just their age, but do they have CKD? Do they have diabetes? Are there procedural factors? So long, long lesion stented, multiple stents. If they don't have any of those high risk features, if it's just age, then I would probably go with ticagrelor. But if it's high ischemic risk and high bleeding risk, then I would look at which, you know, trying to balance the two to achieve a reduction in ischemic risk without an excess risk of bleeding. Very good. If we could go back to the cases, um, I, I see a question that is going to probably be better set up for our second case. Uh, as we go through this in, in consideration. So uh, LL is a 65-year-old female who's 68 kilograms. She status post-PCI to the LED for an NSTEMI. The patient had two drug-loading stents, placed her mid-LED. She was a current smoker, and her EF is normal post-myocardial infarction. 
She had a past medical history of hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and gastric ulcers. She had, at the time, uh, SIP2C19 testing sent, and we're waiting for the results to come to that. And we talked a little bit about that during the conversation. And she's concerned about being able to uh, obtain her medications. And so <clears throat> in this context, and we can contextualize it both depending on her genetic results, um, you know, what, what do you consider has your choice in, in this instance, um, you know, and then kind of thinking about if she develops adverse dry, uh, side effects like dyspnea, what do you do if you were to pick tachyolar? And then more related to our question that we have from the audience, you know, what do you do with your dual antiplatelet at 30 days, at one year, at, at three years out in, in a more chronic situation? So I'll pause. There are a lot of different questions to think through in this scenario, but just, you know, given the different things that we're waiting for from a data point, how does that drive your decision? So very, very interesting case. Again, relatively young, but as Professor Dorog's already alluded to, we need to think about what's the ischemic risk. You mentioned that we've got a PCI to LAD, also two drug eluting stents, and we know that the more stents that you put in, the greater the risk of acute stent thrombosis. So we need to think about that as a potential thrombotic risk, but also take into consideration the bleeding risk. The other thing to just be mindful when you're interpreting clinical trials, in particular regards to oral antiplatelets, so the Plato or the Triton Timmy, we just have to be mindful that every single clinical trial has an inclusion criteria and an exclusion criteria. And if you look at some of the exclusion criteria, they'll often talk about patients who have had a recent high risk of major bleeding or a recent major bleed would have been excluded in the clinical trials. And often patients with many comorbidities or end-stage kidney disease or liver disease, these patients would traditionally be excluded from clinical trials. So we just have to bear that in mind, which is why it's so, so important that we look at the individual in front of us and not just apply the clinical trials just blindly thinking that Ticagula will be superior for everyone. And as which is why I'm a big fan of the popular age around highlighting that we do need to think about, you will get the reduction in efficacy, but at the expense of major bleeding. What we need to do now is apply those clinical trials to the individual in front of us. Locally, we assess the risk of thrombotic based on GRACE, and we use Crusade, which is a major bleeding risk score based on real world registry data. And with Professor Gorg's highlighted about the has bled. So we need to have some way of assessing that bleeding risk and then decide as to which is the more appropriate agent. Interesting, you mentioned about the SIP2C19, and it'll be interesting to see whether people apply that into clinical practice locally and whether that would define people's choice of therapy. But my feeling is at the moment is, and I appreciate that the US may be slightly different in many countries where they pay for their prescriptions will be variable depending if it's Ticagrelor or Clopidogrel. But certainly within the UK, the choice is the same. We will still most likely go with Ticagrelor, assuming that the bleeding risk is suitable, especially noting that we've got the two drug eluting stents. And one of the key questions would be, are they kissing stents? Are they doing any other things that may increase that risk of thrombosis? Perfect. And I'm going to let Professor Gorey add her her commentary. So I, I think I would just come back to the financial situation in, in, in other countries. But in the UK, we're in an enviable position that it's not an issue. But I would say that the most important thing for this lady is that she is on a P2Y12 inhibitor. So if she's on Ticagrelor and there is a risk that she will stop it because she cannot afford to renew her prescription, I would rather she was on clopidogrel or I would give her a backup prescription. Of course, ideally, we would want this lady on Ticagrelor. She's an acute coronary syndrome. She should be on Ticagrelor. But if there's a financial risk, then let's give her clopidogrel. Um, and of course, let's get her tested. Um, to see if she's got one or more of the loss of function alleles. Um, but but probably just want to make the point that it's important that she just gets a P2Y12 inhibitor. Sure. And let me ask you this and kind of relate to the question in the chat box, but just putting this all in context, are you uh, in your practice, you know, in a patient like this or looking at it, uh, changing your duration of 
uh, do I type of the therapy based on their bleeding risk? Are you continuing beyond a year if it's a higher risk patient? How, how are you evaluating this? And I left the patient a little open ended to be able to have these conversations, but you know, obviously a lot of hot topic is you know based on Master DAP and, and Twilight and all the other things. You know, do we do a shorter course? Do you do the twelve months? Do you go beyond twelve months? You know, what are what are you looking at for this particular patient? So. So I think practice is changing. I think maybe five years ago, we would be doing a one size fits all of one year DAPT following an ACS. I think practice is definitely changing. Um, for a number of years now, I think if the patient is at low bleeding risk and they come to the end of one year and they've tolerated the P2Y12 inhibitor well without bleeding and they have additional ischemic risk factors, typically type 2 diabetes, uh, renal impairment, long segment of stenting or prior thrombosis, you might continue to Cagrelor at 60 milligram twice a day for a further two years, so a maximum of three years. Again, with increased awareness over the last few years of the, the, the risk of bleeding, and particularly with the number of studies that have now come out in favor of de-escalation, so reducing either the intensity or the duration of antiplatelet therapy, we are again much more mindful of that so I would feel far more comfortable de-escalating now than I would have uh, a few years back. And that's really de-escalation either by giving ticagrelor maybe just for the highest risk period, which is usually the first one to three months. And then you could either stop the ticagrelor altogether or you could uh, de-escalate to clopidogrel for the rest of the six months or a year if you're really worried about high bleeding risk. And the other possibility is just giving dual antiplatelet therapy for six months and stopping it altogether if you're worried about an, an excess bleeding risk. So I think increasingly practice is, is and should be much more personalized than it has been in the past. And we should be not only making that decision at the time when the patient is discharged from hospital, but reassessing that patient at one month, at three months, at six months, and then at a year. And at each time point, asking about bleeding, assessing bleeding risk factors, and considering ischemic risk and, and re-evaluating. Yeah, I think that's really Dr. important. Dr. Shane, would you like to add or... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, Dr. Beavers. Um, I think it's really important to recognise that even though somebody may have come in with acute coronary syndrome and had that one event, we're not changing the pathophysiological process by putting a stent in. And so there is that risk of a subsequent events. And some of the data has shown us that often they'll come back with another heart attack, but in a different artery. So it's really, really important. And we are noticing about individualizing therapy where we may give somebody ticagrelor or even just whilst they're in hospital for that key period and then switching or over three months switching to clopidogrel. I think most people will feel more confident for trying to extend the duration of dual antiplatelet for as close to the year as possible, but more and more data. And as the stents improve with reducing that thrombogenicity with associated with the stents, hopefully that will give us more and more data that we can stop the dual antiplatelets even earlier and subsequently reducing the risk of major bleeding <coughs> earlier. No, I, your point is well taken. When I educate patients about anything post MI, I always remind them the importance of their secondary prevention. I said, because we have not actually fixed your disease process. We have put a Band-Aid on it for the time being. They think because they were in such bad chest pain and we've done something that they're cured and they were, we, we, this is a mitigating factor. We still have a lot of work to do <laughs> beyond this thing. Dr. Chain, would you add anything or have questions that you'd like to ask to, to the team? What? Yeah, actually, yes. Um, concerning the two C nineteen um polymorphism, because as Asian, the prevalence is much higher than in the Western countries. So, um, we do, but we don't normally do the genetic tests in Hong Kong. But sometimes we actually do the platelet reactivity during the test to see how reactive the platelet is. Do you guys? have any experience on the use of the PRU instead of the genetic testing regarding the use of antipolela? Maybe Professor Goron? Yes, indeed. So um, the tropical uh, study looked at this. So in tropical, they de-escalated from prasagrel to clopidogrel in people who were 
uh, pharmacodynamically responsive, um, so they had good inhibition of platelet aggregation, that seemed to be a safe approach to reducing the risk of bleeding and ischemic risk. And I think just coming back to you about ethnic variability, I think that's very important because we also know that East Asians are, are at higher bleeding risk than, than other populations. So I think many of the guidelines in East Asia would recommend a lower intensity of uh, P2Y12 inhibitor. So more often using clopidogrel than prasugrel or ticagrelor, unless of course there are very high ischemic uh, risks in the patient. But I also share your point that, P2, that, that sensitivity, um, or oh, so, sorry, the, the genetic testing for clopidogrel is not widely available. So it is available much more in the US than in, in many parts of Europe. And also, it may not be so quick to do. Although there is a point of care test, uh, many centres still rely on sending a sample to the laboratory. And of course, by the time you do, you've done that and the patient comes back, you've exposed them potentially to risk. Um, so I, on a practical level, I agree with you. I'm not sure how useful genetic testing is. Um, I think if you really wanted to be absolutely sure, I guess you would combine genetic testing with uh, platelet aggregation. Any comment for you, Sotaris? Yeah, um, we probably use two thirds ticagrelor, one third clopidogrel. And in our local population, we're very big on South Asians. And I've always got that thing in the back of my mind as to how many of our patient population have got the 2C19 genomic factors. And we're quite fortunate in that genomics is becoming more mainstream in the UK now. Hopefully there's going to be some further opportunities for genomics. And so I think this is going to be quite interesting. And in fact, a small group has looked at our patient population to look at specifically the 2C19 um allele and, and our local population and it's quite prevalent so we're now starting to wonder whether that's translating to differences in the expected outcomes that we would expect by giving in these patients the pedigree so i think it's you know we've looked at very far now and if you look at the placement aggregation data it's not as strong as perhaps we would have liked and it doesn't translate to the clinical outcomes that we may have expected. And so we just have to recognize that this is very multifactorial and, you know, simple things like the biggest contributor to stent thrombosis is that premature discontinuation of dual antiplatelet therapy. And so you do wonder whether the genomic factors will play a bigger part if we had more of that data and how that translated into the real world outcomes but i think we're still waiting for that big data analysis to give us that true assessment thank you so i think um that concludes our panel discussion as well and i think we also answered quite a number of questions from the audience but uh, we do still welcome um any questions and i think one of them is about the use of bleeding school i think sorceress mentioned that um um, you use Christie score a lot uh, more than the Hesperus score. Can you comment on um, any reason why you prefer Christie score over the Hesperus one? Um, I, th I think the main thing, if I was to really take away, people are more familiar with the Hasbled simply because of the atrial fibrillation, which was much more awareness from the Hasbled score. And some of them are similar factors. The reason why we use the Crusade is that it's a bleeding risk score that's derived in acute coronary syndrome patients. And so from our perspective, it's more accurate. You would argue it has the more relevant factors and it has been shown in relation to the ACS. I think I would just take away whilst we're focusing on bleeding and maybe have that debate we're starting to learn more that if you have a major bleed with people with acute coronary syndrome, it's translating to a high risk of mortality. So we do need to assure ourselves that we are trying to mitigate the risks where possible. And so hopefully one of the key messages for me is not to just blindly think that a more potent antiplatelet is suitable for all. 
And hopefully we've discussed a lot around the ischemic risk and the potential bleeding risk. And just think about that frail old lady that comes in and think about whether ticagrelor for 12 months is the most suitable or whether we think we might be increasing their risk of major bleeding and actually translating that to increasing their risk of harm when a, perhaps a more appropriate antiplatelet might might been that choice. So we use a crusade and that's because it has been derived within an ACS cohort. I'd be interested to know what others are using, if any. We've, I have to say we've been using the Has Bled score because it's uh, it's easy to use. It's um, but I completely agree with you. Um, the other thing, the other that Crusade is is much more validated in an ACS population. I think at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter which score one uses. Most of the risk factors are overlapping. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that the risk factors sometimes overlap between the ischemic and the bleeding risk scores. So it's, it's all very, and, and we don't have an ischemic risk score calculator. So there isn't a, a magic sort of, if this number is this and that number is that, then, then the balance tips in favor. I think one has to, this is where uh, we still have to individualize um, patients. And of course, the other thing to think about is whichever score you use, some risk factors are modifiable. So we should be putting these patients on a P2Y12 inhibitor. We should be controlling their blood pressure. We should be um, looking at if they've got impaired liver function again, we should be avoiding them, uh, advising them about uh, uh, avoiding excess alcohol. So all the things we can do, which is not just assessing risk, but modifying the risk factors. So, so well, I, I think that's probably another point to make, to, to, to assess the risk and then to reassess, to see if the patient's modified um, those risk factors. Well, to, to those points too, depending on their risk over time, you know, if you're on a potent agent, you know, dropping the aspirin, you know, removing other things that are added, added bleeding risk from that standpoint. All right, Dr. Chang, I think we have to wrap up at this this juncture. Yeah, I'm afraid that's all the time we got to, to today. So I'd like to remind you all of you that today's um, proceedings will be shortly available on demand on the WWE www.wetclubcardiology.com. So to get access to more content and learn about the opportunities offered by the International Society of Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy and how to become a member, um, sorry, please scan the QR code or visit our website. So and stay tuned for the next uh, webinar of A to Z, A to Z CV pharmacotherapy series, which will be held in on 8th February, February 2023. So mark your calendars and more details will be coming soon. So before we go, um, we'd like to thank you, our faculty today, for all the fantastic con contribution. Um, Professor Gorok and uh, Mr. Antonio, and finally, Dr. Beavis. Thank so you. we would also like to thank you, our sponsor, AstraZeneca UK, who have supported this section for an unrestricted ed educational grant. And finally, uh, thank you to all of you, our audience, for joining us. Um, uh, it's a little bit late in Hong Kong. It's already 1 a.m. So I, I plan to wrap up and go to sleep. So we hope that you have found this insightful and to have met these objectives. So remember, this event is a CME accredited. So please don't forget um, to submit your details to claim your certificates. Uh, thank you and goodbye and good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.